Hey, Luke. Hey, Aaron. Good to see you. Yep, you too. Thanks for coming. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the invitation. Do you want to give your slides a test? Yeah, sure. Um, Hi, Franz. Yeah, okay, that working okay? Yeah, looks great. Video looks good. Yeah, looks awesome. Okay, great. Hey, Franz, do you want to test out your slide? Uh, you're still on uh, mute, Fran. On mute. Now you can hear oh, me? You yes, there you yeah. go. Okay. Share. How does looks it look? Good. Yeah, oh, that's good. Yeah, thank okay. you. Can click. There's one video. Can try. We have a sleep session today. Mm -hmm. I realized that. Yeah. <laughs> It wasn't intentional. Okay, I just wanted to ask. <laughs> yeah, it just worked. Just worked out that way. Okay. Um, stop. How's everything going in Philadelphia? Um, good. Yeah, you have been there before. Yeah, it's. Yeah. I was born there. Went to school there. Worked okay. there. Okay, everything. My favorite city. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, everything. Pretty back to normal. Yeah. So you're in neuroscience department? Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was in the uh, um, cell and developmental biology department. Okay. Yeah. Till when? Till 2011. Okay. Oh, it's a long time. Oh, Till 2012, yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> to me, it doesn't seem like a long time ago. Okay. I guess, yeah, I guess, yeah over 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah I came here in 2017. Ah, okay. Yeah. Where do you live in Philadelphia? Uh, in Graduate Hospital. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah um, I know. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, very comfortable. Um, mm -hmm. Just 10 minute walk to the lab. There's a place nearby called Fittler Square. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was always planning to go with my kids and at the middle of the night change it to Gittler Square. <laughs> <laughs> I used to live in, um, well, first 21st in Chestnut, then 20th in Walnut, then 23rd in Race, then Maniunk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we are at Bainbridge Street. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's like one block south of south. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh huh. Yeah. And yeah, it's good to live there. How's the na naval yard? That was like up and coming when I moved. Okay. Back I mean, that's yeah, fully up and running. Actually, we are in the neighboring, we are living in the neighboring condominium, mm -hmm. and which doesn't feel so. Yeah. Close community life. I mean, it's like yeah. we have a house that's just normal on the street. And oh, nice. yeah, actually, we got it because it had a garage and it was so difficult to find. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Delong. Hi, Franz. Okay. Uh, hi, I see you. Yeah. Hey. And then I did Franz one summer with my family in Munich, and that was great. In 2016, I spent a summer in Munich. Hmm. Nice. Where? At which institute? No institute. Um, I just um, it was just uh, just for the summer, and I just went around. I went around to mm -hmm. all the different institutes just to visit. Mm -hmm. and it was, we had a we rented an apartment right off of the um, English Garden. Oh, that's uh, nice. That's very nice. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. I don't know how well you studied my CV, but yeah, I did my PhD in Munich. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. No, that's why. That's why I'm mentioning. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was it was great. It was a uh, university hot the that metro station. Mm -hmm. 
and then my friend has a has a really nice apartment on Maximilianstrasse, so I would visit often. So long, how are you holding up? Yeah, I was. I still have some uh, moderate hope. Are we gonna unlock for a few in a few days, maybe? Uh, maybe a week. <laughs> Hopefully soon. I think. I think maybe. <laughs> Maybe end of April. <laughs> See, you, you, you are, you are, you are undergoing a lockdown in U.S. and lockdown in China. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I was just, yeah, I was just saying. I like, I like twenty twenty one China better than twenty twenty two China. Season. Oh yeah, we, we, we definitely hope we'll get the, the virus it. getting weaker and weaker, and yeah, we finally. Yeah. Uh, Do you have everything you need? Yeah, yeah. Have the food, a coffee. Coffee is most important. Yeah, uh, we couldn't survive without coffee, even at home. I'm running low yeah. on coffee. I, I got I really, just, but I'm, I'm saving it. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I think, I, th I think it'll last. I'm running a little bit now. That's more important than food. Yeah. Yeah. My um, wife was volunteering, handing out food last night, late last night, and. Oh. Um, like someone, someone came up to her and was just like yelling at her, like you know, like your country's doing this and that. She's like, I'm just here volunteering to help. And um, <laughs> but we'll get through it. Yeah. How are things, Luke, in New York? Um, things are good. You know, everything's like. People aren't wearing masks now. A lot of places, it's really weird, actually. Um, you know, but stuff's getting back to normal. I went up to dinner at a restaurant, like no masks, completely packed, and I was like, I'm totally yeah, catching yeah. COVID. <laughs> yeah. And then I didn't, so I, don't, I mean, at least that was one time. So I guess it's like Russian roulette. Just rolling the dice. Yeah. I'm jealous was, of your I hair. Was, oh, thanks. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah, I should like whatever. Uh, no, yeah, go with it. Um, you're living in the Bronx or do you live in Manhattan? I live in Manhattan. I live in Harlem. Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, my wife and I, we bought a brownstone here and renovated it. So, basically, we're never leaving this place. Like, someday archaeologists will find our bleached skeletons in this house. <laughs> we're oh, never nice. leaving. So. Oh, it's rare to own a, own a house. That's great. Yeah, we got super, super lucky. Um, just Is she rich? Right or... oh, yeah, you just got lucky. Uh, Lucky, mostly, yeah. Okay, okay, nice. So, um, Aaron, how many people usually come to this? I'm just out of curiosity. Um, what do you think, Zolong? One, one, fifty. You, you only went fifty. Yeah, yeah, one fifty. It's gone up to five hundred. Yeah, you're the very popular person, like uh, Li Chunlo, I guess. You know, crazy number. Uh, yeah, most probably uh, Feng Zhang or something. Yeah. Franz, I asked um, your postdoc advisor, mm -hmm. Young Don, to come, and she said, Aaron, um, I, I see your emails about these. I really think it's a great thing, but it conflicts with my lab meeting, so I will never attend them and I will never <laughs> give a talk. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh. It's right. It's I, I still remember it's Monday. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Monday, five. Monday at five. So it's true. Okay, so that's at least yeah, it was true. Okay, yeah. at least it was true. Okay. It's Monday five p.m. <laughs> for for lab meeting. Lab meeting. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, young lab, right? It's mm -hmm. young lab. Mm -hmm. It's fun. Yeah. It's uh, <laughs> it's it's better than seven p.m. Right? Sure. Better than seven a.m. Actually, my lab meeting is at four p.m. Just because I. Because I'm in China, so it, it's oh. seven a.m. Yeah. But you're home too long. You're. Yeah, yeah. Of course, I'm okay. home. No, I mean, like, so I need hotel. <laughs> but some people are at like campus or something. Or... Oh, that's 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 more miserable because they stay yeah. weeks up there. Hmm. All right, so get started. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to 
uh, Shanghai quarantine edition again of NeuroZoom. But um, as long as we're locked down, Tuong and I'll be back every week with great science to get us all through it. So thanks for joining and participating. Next week, we have great talks. So tune in to see Haiyang Yu from UT Southwestern, also talking to EP43, and Margaret Ho from Shanghai Tech University talking about the role of glia in neurogeneration. So a uh, neurogeneration session uh, next week. And um, now it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Franz Weber. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Neuroscience at the University of Pennsylvania. He uh, did his bachelor's degree, master's degree, and PhD all in Munich. And um, during his uh, PhD, he studied um, um, neuron, how neurons can integrate their um, activity and uh, used theoretical and functional studies of, of these, and then moved to uh, UC Berkeley, where he did a postdoctoral fellowship with Yang Dan. And here's where he started to study uh, sleep and, in particular, uh, mechanisms of uh, rapid eye movement, or REM, uh, REM sleep. And this is the sleep phase, which I'll tell us about, where we have these uh, 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 vivid dreams. And he made a very important uh, discovery published in Nature, where he um, show, proved a role that the, the uh, uh, circuits in the um, medulla play in um, initiating REM sleep. And he used this amazing um, gain of function and loss of function approach using optogenetics, where he can activate uh, GABA uh, neurons in the medulla, and it induced REM sleep, and then he can inactivate it, and it uh, withdrew them from REM sleep, and then he recorded these neurons and found where they, and then found where they projected. So an amazing uh, story, which launched his lab, where he's continuing to study um, medullary contributions to REM sleep and um, other, other uh, sleep-related mechanisms. So I'm looking forward to hearing the latest, Franz. Yeah, thanks so much for the very thorough and nice introduction. Um, I will share my slides. Okay. Yeah. And actually, Aaron gave a very good introduction because I kind of will continue on this topic. Um, and uh, instead of a population of venture medulla, I will talk about a population of dorsal medium medulla that does also similar things, but there were some novel interesting aspects to it. So, um, right, I'm very interested in the regulation of Ramsey. So first of all, also as I mentioned, that's the brain state that is associated with vivid dreaming. So dreams in general can happen during non and Ramsey, but these dreams where you have weird storylines, you cannot escape the plot and where you hope or please wake up or is it a dream or not, that's definitely REM sleep. And so REM sleep is also <clears throat> often called paradoxical sleep because on the one hand, behaviorally, you are totally asleep. In fact, your muscles are paralyzed due to an atonia that is thought to prevent you from acting out your dreams. So in that sense, you are totally asleep. You cannot move. But at the same time, the uh, cortical EEG um, looks very much like Turing vectorless. So this here is data from the mouse. You see Turing REM sleep and the EEG, this beautiful seven, eight hertz theta oscillation that come from a activation of the hippocampus. <clears throat> and that looks pretty much like Turing wakefulness when the mouse is actually running around. Then you have also theta oscillations. So you have these two phenomena on the one hand activated EEG and at the same time the muscle paralysis. So the humans enter REM sleep about every uh, 90 minutes and stay in there about 20 to 30 minutes. In the mice, it's, everything is much faster. So they enter REM sleep about every 10 minutes, but there's quite a huge variation. And actually one topic in my lab is, um, which I'm very interested in is understanding what actually may determine when we enter REM sleep. I will touch this a little bit at, towards the end of the talk, but the main topic of the talk will be about a circuit in the dorsal medulla controlling REM sleep. As I have to say, most of the data is published, but throughout the pandemic, I never had the chance to present that. And I'm really excited to finally have here the chance on your Zoom 
2% of the data. So what's the current kind of textbook view or the yeah, general picture how REM sleep is regulated? So first of all, for sure, the circuits that generate REM sleep and its defining features, they are in the brainstem. So that includes <coughs> first um, the pons. So in there is, for example, this area SLD, sublateral dorsal nucleus, that's very important for the induction of muscle atonia, probably also for the regulation of REM sleep itself. Then there are neurons <coughs> in the midbrain, for example, in the VLPEC, ventrolateral periductal gray, that, uh, or the neighboring DPME or the dorsal raphae, that can very powerfully suppress REM sleep. And they are also least active during REM sleep, and we call them REM off neurons. Then neurons that turn REM sleep on, so called REM on neurons, you can find them throughout the brainstem and also in areas outside of the brainstem, for example, in lateral hypothalamus, this so-called MCH neuron. And about two weeks ago, there's been uh, also a science study on the amygdala playing a potent role in inducing REM sleep. So the medulla has been traditionally mainly studied for its role in inducing this muscle atonia through inhibitory glycinoic projections to motor neurons in the spinal cord. Um, but again, as I mentioned in my introduction during my postdoc, I found uh, this population of ventral medullary neurons projecting to the midbrain. When you activate them, you can trigger a Um, Like starting the lab, I was interested also in this uh, area in the dorsal medial medulla. But, um, so, so why that? But what made us interested <coughs> in this area? So first of all, electrophysiological recordings from other labs have shown there are highly REM active neurons. Then electrical stimulation studies um, have shown that you can maintain REM sleep by stimulating in this area. And then, uh, so this figure here is uh, from the lab of Pierre Avelup in France. So they performed their CFOS staining for GABA ergic CFOS labeled neurons after rats experience a lot of REM sleep induced by REM sleep deprivation. So again, the red dots here are neurons that are inhibitory and most likely REM sleep active. You see here a dense cluster in the dorsal medium medulla. And okay, we wonder now what's the precise role of these neurons in inducing, maintaining REM sleep, and also what are here the underlying circuit mechanisms, how these neurons may control REM sleep. So to get into this, we started with very basic optogenetic experiment. So we take a get to cream mouse and check the virus to infect GABAergic neurons with channel dots and EVIFP. So for those who know about brain slate circuits, so the areas we mainly infected here are the nucleus, I want the laser pointer, yeah, are the nucleus repositus hypoglossy uh, that lines here the ventricle and below uh, the so-called dorsal paratragantula reticular nucleus. So here is then an example recording session. So the mouse uh, spends time in the home cage and from time to time we turn on the laser. It was for two minutes, uh, about every 20 minutes. And you can see already here in this example, whenever the laser turns on, there is a theta band in the EEG, which is indicative of REM sleep, while the EMG amplitude is flat. So this example suggests Activation of these neurons pushes the mouse from non-REM into REM sleep. Um, I don't know how well it works. Here's also a video. So the mouse is currently in non-REM sleep sleeping. Um, laser turns on pretty early on. You can see already stuff happening in the theta range. So there comes a theta band up, uh, which gets more and more clear till the mouse eventually goes into REM sleep. Now we see a pretty clear theta band. The mouse, I think in this example, stays on a little bit after the laser ends and then wakes up with a short uh, motion. Okay, um, now for analysis, we take in all these laser stimulation trials and can calculate the percentage that the mouse and in either REM, wake or non-REM during the laser interval. And you can see here a very strong increase of REM sleep during the two minute stimulation interval. Now, consistent 
with the run promoting effect of these neurons, we see also in the in the laser trial average EG spectrogram a very distinct theta band. Uh, delta power goes strongly down, and we have an increase in the gamma range about 50 to 100 hertz, which is also characteristic of phenomenon um, of Ramsey and part of its weight like character. Okay, so next um, we wanted, <clears throat> now so far we have shown that yeah, we can induce non ram to ram transitions. We wanted then, then we also maintain Ramsey. Um, so here we do closed loop simulation. So the mouse sleeps and the mouse spontaneously transitions into Ramsey. And only then we turn the laser on, but it's automatically detected the onset of Ramsey. And the laser stays on as long as the mouse stays in Ramsey. But only for a subset of the RAM periods, we turn on the laser to have uh, RAM periods with and without laser from the same recording session. And overall, there's a strong increase in the duration of RAM periods that overlap with laser. And we don't see any effect in either HP. So there's also another interesting effect going on actually, because RAM periods with laser are longer, the RAM periods without the laser are actually shorter than in the EVIFP control. So it's really uh, on that time course, some homeostatic compensation happening. Okay, so these experiments suggest these neurons also strongly maintain RAMC. So next we want out what happens when we inhibit these neurons. So here, one strategy we used uh, is the bistable um, chloride channel switcher. So the closure rate of that channel is about one to two minutes. So you turn it on with a short laser pulse and then the channels stay uh, open about up to two minutes. To be on the safe side, throughout four hours, we stimulated every 50 seconds for every 50 seconds for one second. And uh, that led to a reduction um, of REM sleep in recording sessions with continuous laser stimulation. And this effect was pretty specific to REM sleep. So there was no significant change in non REM sleep or in wake. And yeah. Okay, I thought I heard a question. Okay, and this effect was largely, that well, was completely explained by a reduction in the frequency of REM sleep periods while there was no effect on the duration of REM sleep. So these experiments also suggest these neurons play an important role in promoting transitions to REM sleep. So the next question then, what are the projections or what are the circuit mechanisms underlying this effect? Um, so I injected general gopsin, EVIFP in the dorsal medium medallion, and get to three miles and then follow the exon projection. So it generally go pretty much along the midline. And there's a, a lot of you know, exon labeling you could find in the dorsal and median roughly at, at the boundary of the pons and the midbrain. So a previous study from Viviana Gardinaro's lab has shown that activating serotonergic neurons in the dorsal roughly actually can suppress REM sleep and kind of freezes the mouse in non-REM sleep. So they stay in non-REM sleep, they cannot transition out of it. In short, these neurons, serotonergic neurons in this area suppress REM sleep. And we then wondered, okay, could it be that you now these inhibitory projections from the dorsal medium medulla to these REM suppressing areas might just then promote uh, transitions to REM sleep. So the experiment, uh, we did was the following. So we made use of this retrograde AAV that preferentially infects exon terminals. So we injected into the dorsal median rough area, it infects, you see the injection site. Uh, yeah, it infects then projection neurons to this area. Here you see uh, this neuron at the level of the dorsal medium medulla where we then implanted the optic fiber. And stimulating uh, then these projection neurons to the rough nuclei also promoted REM sleep at a magnitude comparable to stimulating the whole population. So in short, these yeah, subpopulation of rough rejecting neurons is sufficient to induce REM sleep. So next we wondered, okay, what about the activity of these neurons? Of course, we expect that they are activated during REM sleep. 
but yeah, to figure that out, uh, we performed five photometries, so or we get to Kremers and check GCAM 6S, and then image uh, these neurons. And as you can see in this example, so the activity of these neurons was indeed always highest during REM sleep. And when we averaged across all the mice, the highest activity is indeed during REM sleep. Um, then you can do also things. You can look at the activity relative to the brain state transitions. So that's the activity relative to non-REM to REM transition. You see already yeah, long before the actual transition, the activity starts increasing and then is highest actually during REM sleep. And then the activity decays at the end of REM sleep. So this is consistent with the idea that these neurons promote non-REM to REM transitions. Um, but actually, what another feature of the activity here that started us, yeah, we got very excited about um, was actually the activity during non -MC. So when you look closely here, you can see the pretty regular oscillation happening. And when you look at the time legend at a time scale of about 50 to 60 seconds, so 50, 60 second cycle happening during non -MC. Um so a previous study from Anita Lütens lab uh, in Lausanne has shown that in the EEG in mice and actually also in human, there's a very pronounced infraslow oscillation in the sigma power. So in the 10 to 15 Hertz range, exactly on the time scale. So here this kind of uh, bluish color here shows you the sigma power. You can also see that the sigma power kind of slowly oscillates during normal sleep. So you can then take the sigma power and perform Fourier transform, and then uh, you will find a peak at around 0 0.02 hertz, corresponding to a wavelength of about 50, 60 seconds. We did the same for the calcium signal from the neurons and see a peak exactly at the, uh, the same frequency, suggesting that this, this os is interest oscillation in the sigma power and the calcium signal may be correlated. So we tested it, so we calculated the cross correlation of the sigma power and the calcium activity, and they are indeed strongly correlated during normal sleep. And now comparing the correlation between different frequency bands, we found that the correlation is indeed strongest for the sigma power and not at all strong actually for the delta power. Okay, now seeing that the activity of these GABA neurons and the dosmedala follows this striking rhythm in the EEG, the striking infraslow rhythm. We wondered whether this infraslow rhythm actually may play a role in timing on a minute time scale when REM sleep occurs. So we went back to our optogenetic data set. So there are two data sets. The one is where we simulated all the neurons in the dorsal median medulla, and the other data set where we only simulated the subpopulation that projects to the dorsal median roughly. And overall, there's a pretty large var variation and a delay. So it, uh, how long it takes till REMC is induced. So in some cases, you turn on the laser, REMC happens right away. In other cases, it can take, as you can see, nearly the whole laser stimulation interval. So to check whether this infraslow modulation may have any impact on this delay, uh, we did the following analysis. So again, we take, we take all the laser stimulation trials preceded by non-REM sleep. During these trials, uh, using Hilbert transform, we determine the phase of this oscillation in sigma power, and then determine what was the delay between the phase at laser onset till REM sleep occurred. And overall, you can see that delay was actually shortest. Okay, here, um, the zoom window is here in the way, but you can see it. So the delay was um, shorted during the falling phase um, of the infrasource oscillation. Uh, next, we wondered, what about the probability? So that's, the phase at which the laser starts also determine how likely it is REM sleep is induced. While well, the results are here for both data sets, no effect at all. But it's not astonishing probably at all when you think about it because the laser stimulation is so long, it's two minutes long. Within two minutes, you can fit in 
two whole oscillation cycles of the sigma power. So assuming there is a preferred phase, there's sufficient opportunity for the laser to eventually overlap with the most affected phase. So to test an effect on the probability, we, in other words, we needed to shorten the laser stimulation to run. And shortening also had another advantage, as you can see, so we settled down on a 50 second stimulation protocol. We only stimulated for 50 seconds. And in that case, the probability to, to induce Ramsey is reduced. It's only about maximally 20%. But this is a huge advantage because now we have trials where laser stimulation is not successful in triggering Ramsey in an analysis where it is successful. So this way we have kind of a balanced data set of success and non-success to figure out for which phases can be successfully trigger RAMSI for which one's not. So first of all, what about the latency? Well, the latency for this 50 second simulation is again uh, shortest during the falling phase. Now comes the most interesting data point. The probability is highest also during the falling phase. So in other words, if stimulation of the dorsal medial medulla garbage neurons coincides with the falling phase of the infraslow oscillation in sigma power, it's most efficient um, to induce RAPSI, most efficient in terms of latency and probability. So, and it also means that this infraslow oscillation does play a role in timing uh, RAPSI. So what's now the broader significance of that? So I mentioned before this group, uh, an Italian group that described this infrasore oscillation in the EEG, and they actually in their experiments presented random auditory stimuli and uh, then analyzed under which condition is it most likely, uh, is it easiest to wake up or not wake up a mouse by an auditory stimulus. And it was also when this auditory stimuli <laughs> overlap with the falling phase that is most likely to wake up the animals. So the falling phase where we also can most successfully trigger MC. In other words, it means during the rising phase, it is hardest to awaken the animal. And also during the rising phase, it's hardest for us to uh, induce uh, REM sleep through activation of REM promoting neurons. So that may mean that this 30 second window of the rising phase in the interest of oscillation might be some kind of protected uh, or stable window of non-REM sleep where it's very hard to wake the animal up or force it to REM sleep. So in other way, that window may be ideal for processes where uh, non-REM sleep should not be interrupted. So something perhaps like memory processing, but it's up to future studies to figure out. Yeah, and with that, I'm here at my summary, which is very short, uh, garbage neurons, dorsal media data, promote REM sleep by projections to the dorsal median ruffle. The activity of these DNA neurons fluctuates in synchrony with the EEG sigma power, and this sigma power oscillation influences the time of REM sleep by uh, the DMM activation. And with that, I want to thank all the people in the lab who did the work and especially uh, Joe Stokinski, who um, yeah, drove this project as a research specialist in the lab. And thanks a lot. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thanks so much, Franz. Great talk. And we have, uh, we're open for questions. I was just wondering, Franz, what is the significance of the activity of these GABA neurons all during REM sleep, but also during feeding behavior. Is there any, is that incidental or is that connected? Um, yeah, actually in, <clears throat> so we know that these neurons, um, I don't know whether you can see it in a sample. They are also, they can also be active during wakefulness. Um, we tried things like studying motor behavior, whether there's any correlation um, that these neurons are more activated when the mouse is running or something like this. It's not the case. So we, in short, we didn't figure out the actual behavior when they become active. I have to say, um, this area we are studying, um, uh, it, the neurons are mainly in the nucleus propositus. That's an area that's traditionally studied for gaze control. 
So, which sounds totally may sound weird, but on the other hand, perhaps not. I mean, REM sleep has eyes in its title. So, um, yeah, we have some ideas what these neurons may do in terms of eye movement control. And it could be that, you know, the same subset of neurons playing a role in eye control also plays a role in REM sleep control. Is it also, does it also control that in the mouse? Does REM sleep also associate with rapid eye movement? Uh, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Other questions for Franz? I had a question. Um, Go ahead. So Franz, I'm curious, so do you think these cells, what do you think the role of these cells would be in something like narcolepsy where you have sort of inappropriate REM leaking in at random times? Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a, I'd say a big question in the field, how much does the narcolepsy or cataplexy circuitry overlap with the REM circuitry. I can only speculate. Um, so <clears throat> these neurons themselves, they do not seem to have a direct effect on muscle atonia. So for example, you stimulate during wakefulness when the mouse is moving, it will not make the mouse stop. So in that sense, I don't think they are directly part yeah, of this atonia circuit. And if you define cataplexy as mainly an intrusion, intrusion of sudden muscle paralysis, um, I speculate that perhaps these neurons may not be part of the cat cataplexic circuits. But yeah, in the end, you have to, the right experiment would be to take a cataplexy mouse and use a cataplexic attack and record the activity of these neurons to prove it. Maybe I could have clarified. So, so in, in narcolepsy, you also have like uh, when people fall asleep, they fall into REM much quicker. I guess maybe that's more what I was asking about. Okay. Yeah, I mean, um, I think we can, I have, I, I would say I cannot come up with a reasonable speculation, but I would say yeah, the experiment is really to take an animal, record these neurons, and see yeah whether there may be some kind of narcolepsy, some kind of dissipation that increases the baseline activity of these neurons and it makes it easier to jump into REM sleep. Uh, hi, friends. I have a quick question about the downstream of the cap. Mm -hmm. uh, get two neurons. So for the dose therapy, do you know what the particular is that inhibition? Uh, for example, serotonin release in, in the downstream? Yeah. Or is, um, is that something you know? In short, I don't know. So we didn't, okay. we only manipulated these projections. We, I mean, we have plans, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, we didn't follow up, you know, really like the uh, serotonin neurons really innovated here. And is it really the okay. suppression okay. of the serotonin? Or make, at, mm -hmm. at, least, mm -hmm. at least doing uh, the maintenance part, so something <laughs> might not be. A big role in there, right? Or I don't know. Um, okay. sorry, could you repeat again? Uh, in, in the maintenance part, uh, at least the maintenance part, serotonin might not go play a big role in the maintenance. Yeah. Okay. Is that question on the chat bar? Let me check. Oh, yeah. 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 So, um, Franz, someone's asking a technical question. Mm -hmm. um, why do you use retro AV channel dopsin 2 for pathway specific stimulation instead of using uh, channel dopsin and stimulating fibers? Uh, we did it too. That also works. Yeah. Um, we did it mainly. Um, but let's say I, I showed this experiment <clears throat> because something I liked a lot about because when you use the radical virus, I mean, you did it expression of cell bodies is pretty sparse in the dorsal medium medulla and they are in a very specific area. So that we, you know, when you inject directly channel dopsin, I mean, it's hard to control. It's tiny nuclei and are you in the nucleus prepositus, are you in the dorsal or gigantular nucleus or the vesicular, vestibular nucleus. If this red grid virus is pretty fine area. And uh, that's why I like a lot of this experiment. But the other one also. Um, uh, William, do you want to ask, ask your question? 
Sure, can you hear me? I'm just yeah. uh, asking about the differences between ventromedial medulla gaba neurons um, that drive REM sleep compared to these dorsal medial medulla gaba neurons that drive REM sleep. Yes, uh -huh. yeah, it's a, uh, uh, yeah, I, I like the question. So um, the projection pattern differs. So that's one big thing. So these ventromedial neurons, they project more to the wheel pack, so they are more lateral. Whereas um, these dorsal medial medullary neurons, they interestingly are way more medial. So they really go in the dorsal roughly, median roughly, and they don't go so much into the VL pack. And then, <clears throat> so that's one. So the projection pattern differs. But in both cases, you could argue, well, I like to think in both cases, the projection go into areas with REM off neurons. So we have REM off neurons in the wheel pack, and they are also, uh, yeah, serotonergic neurons, depending on stimulation by RIN, but they can also powerfully suppress REM sleep. Something I don't know, and I should go simply back to the data and analyze it again. I don't know how strong for the ventromedial neurons is this uh, intraslow modulation of the activity during REM sleep. So that could another difference. Okay, thank you very much, Franz. Awesome talk. And yeah. um, we're going to continue on the theme of sleep. And uh, Zolong, can you introduce Luke? Great. Uh -huh. okay, sure. Uh, thanks for the talk. So, uh, yeah, you, you from Franz's talk, you might appreciate how important the uh, overall uh, large scale neuroactivity might play a role in sleep. So we're happy to have a second talk by uh, uh, by Luke Schroes, Schroesen. Uh, so uh, uh, Luke is from uh, uh, Albert, Albert Einstein in cardiac medicine. So he has bachelor's degree in uh, Johns Hopkins. And uh, ever since after college, uh, he started his uh, uh, study and living in Manhattan, Manhattan Island. So he has a, a, a PhD degree in available uh, cardiac medicine in Cornell. Worked with one of the of the genetic giants, uh, the brain prize winner, the girl uh, Manson Book. So uh, after learning uh, the opportunity tours, he went to uh, college a uh, postdoc with uh, Yuri Bozaki, uh, NYU, where he started to use the larger scale, uh, uh, as well as combining with optogenetics to study uh, uh, studies uh, um, your activity, a variety of physiologic activity. So uh, in uh, in his own lab, Arb Einstein. So uh, <clears throat> sorry. And uh, Luke started he used the uh, combining the epigenetic tools and to study how the uh, the sleep uh, and what happened in the sensory and movement stimuli. So today uh, we're happy to have Luke to talk about his latest uh, you sleep to coincide the neural presentations of uh, movement and the visual stimuli. Okay, welcome, Luke. Oh, thank you, thank you. That was a thanks. It's a very uh. Great introduction. Thanks everyone for coming. So, um, so I'm a psychiatrist and I study drug addiction. That's kind of the main thing. And somehow I'm here talking about sleep and vision. And it's a very, very strange uh, path that, that led here. Um, and, and anyway, but, but I think that the, this talk really isn't about sleep. It's about two bigger questions in neuroscience that are unresolved. And so one of the first ones, which is a surprisingly, almost embarrassingly recent discovery, is that movement evokes activity across the entire brain every time you move. And how is it that this does not interfere with all the other functions of the brain, right? I mean, if, if um, I'll show you a video in a second. Um, another one, which I'll explain more in depth is uh, low dimensional manifolds, which are observed in almost every brain region people seem to record from. I mean, how can that be reconciled with things like high dimensional representations of visual stimuli? So is, is the brain high dimensional or is it low dimensional? Um, and the argument that I'm going to try to make today is that we can gain insight by using sleep as a tool to study some of this stuff. And so I'm going to explain um, each of these two questions before I sort of explain what the, uh, you know, what, what, what the results are. So this is an example of a whole brain zebrafish imaging. Um, and so check and see if you can figure out when the animal moves. See, that's, that's movement. I'll play it a couple more times. See. The whole brain lights up. Sensory areas, motor areas, everything lights up every time it moves. And this is the first demonstration I'm really aware of this showed sort of just the scale of it in zebrafish. That's been shown subsequently um, in, in mice. Um, there's a great paper by uh, Carson Stringer and Marius Pakatariu 
where they uh, track facial motion. And, um, and one of the ideas here is that facial motion is, uh, is multidimensional. So there's, it's not just uh, like a single arousal variable that goes up, up or down. And so there's multiple dimensions of facial motion. So they do uh, neural pixels recordings and they record a bunch of neurons, as you can see there. Then they attempted to uh, just estimate what the neuronal activity, or try, rather they tried to predict what the neuronal activity would be based just on the face movements. And that's the prediction. So as you can see, the based just on face movements, you can predict neuronal activity pretty well in large parts of the brain, right? And um, as you can see here, um, sorry, give me a second, I'll close that thing down. Um, you can see here uh, that different brain regions, all these areas, you can, you can predict a large percentage of the variance just in face movement, um, including here, even, uh, you know, visual cortex, right? So something like 12% of the variance firing in visual cortex can be explained by face movements. So how is it that this is not interfering with vision, for example, if that's what's happening? The second question is, is the question of low versus high dimensional uh, dimensionality. So when people talk about manifolds, the idea here is we have a neuronal state space that has three different, this would be three different neurons and the projection along each axis would be the firing rate of that neuron. So the idea is that um, it seems to not be the case that the trajectory here can go to any place um, in the state space because individual neurons firing is correlated with each other. And so even though we have a three-dimensional state space here, typically what people find is that the actual trajectory representing the population activity uh, is, is restricted to a lower dimensional subspace called a manifold. Okay, so how do we find, find these? And so, um, the, um, so this is an example I have here of low dimensional data and high dimensional data. Okay, so, um, so the, the simplest method for dimensionality reduction, which is what I'm just gonna focus on today is principal components analysis. And so the idea there is you put some just axes there and you can essentially rotate your axes to find the axes that uh, maximize the amount of variance that's explained. Okay, so here, this is low dimensional because you have essentially one dimension, the pink one, which explains the vast majority of the variance. So you could say that this is a one-dimensional manifold or, or subspace that contains a one-dimensional or a one-dimensional subspace, right? So the same thing here, if you just have, uh, you know, random data that's very high dimensional is that you can still find a rotation where, where the first axis explains more variance than, than, um, than the second one. But the simplest method to look at dimensionality, and there's, there's sort of different ways people do this, but the way that I'm going to talk about is just using simply the slope. Of, um, of the decay of how fast it, the amount of variance goes from like first to second and so forth, right? So something's very low dimensional, if it has a, sm if, uh, if this decays very rapidly, it's high dimensional if it decays slowly. And so this is an example of, of some real data when you have a hundred neurons instead of just two, right? And you have the same sort of thing where you have this, this decay. And here we have some pink dimensions, uh, which is sort of like the pink dimensions here that explain more variance than chance. We have gray ones that explain equal levels and we have blue ones that explain less than chance. And so I should say, when I say dimensions or PCs, what I mean is, is that, um, so this pink thing, for example, is a pattern of neuronal activity in which both cells fire at the same time. This blue one would be a pattern of activity in which one cell fires or the other cell fires, but, but not both at the same time, okay? So, um, but the idea, main idea I wanna get here is that um, you, can, you can look at the slope of that and that gives you some idea uh, it's called the Eigen spectrum of how rapidly or, or, or slowly it decays, and that gives you a measure of dimensionality. Okay, so like I said, there's been low dimensional manifolds reported everywhere. Um, and, but there's this interesting study also from Stringer and Pacateriu a couple of years ago, where they do two photon imaging in mouse V1, and they have lots of different visual stimuli. And they gave a bunch of different stimuli. I'm just gonna show three, but they have um, uh, 2,800 natural images. Um, and then they have sort of uh, medium complexity images and low complexity images, right? And, and so what this is, this is the dimensionality of the images, not of the brain activity, but of the images itself. So you can see here this one dimensional gratings, if there's 32 of them, then essentially it's 32 dimensional. Um, this has dimensionality that's sort of intermediate, and then this is fairly high dimensionality. You can see that the, the decay is much slower. So if you look at the neuronal activity, it had previously been reported that uh, activity in V1 is low dimensional, but that's because people were often using low dimensional stimuli. With high dimensional stimuli, it turns out that it's actually pretty high dimensional. Okay. So one thing, the first thing is that it's high dimensional. The second thing is that these dimensions are, um, 
that they're separate from the dimensions which encode behaviors. Okay, so, so it seems that these dimensions are, are largely orthogonal, and so that the brain is using separate dimensions in the state space to, to uh, represent behaviors and then visual stimuli. So how, how is that? So how does any of this make any sense? So what our hypothesis um, going into this, and the reason that I think we can use sleep to study this, is the idea is that there's something different about these dimensions, that there's something different about the way that they're generated, something different about how they work. Um, and the hypothesis <clears throat> is that some of them would be internally generated, um, and some of them would actually be driven by structured inputs, such as inputs from the you know, retina and LGN. Um, so the results, I'm, what I'm going to show you, First is that, is that sleep is the best method to reveal an internally generated low dimensional manifold structure in the brain. Um, that movement encoding is low dimensional because it's restricted to that internally generated, what we call on manifold subspace. And that visual stimulus encoding is high dimensional because it uses both that, but then a separate so-called off manifold subspace, which I'm gonna explain, okay? So first I'm gonna talk about sleep and the reason for using sleep. So the idea is that, um, Sleep, um, so this is an example of awake data in V1. We recorded about 100 neurons here uh, with the silicon probes in a mouse. Um, and then that's what it looks like in the same mouse when it's asleep. You can see the data looks fairly similar you know, between wakefulness and sleep. Um, and what this, this blue uh, curve is right here, uh, these, these are essentially the projection onto the first principal component during sleep and during wakefulness. And what this shows essentially is the first PC is almost exactly the same between these two. And that's actually true that their correlation structure is pretty similar in general. So this is um, similar to the eigenspectrum I showed you earlier, which is showing how much variance is captured by the different principal components. Um, and, and it's on a log scale here. And there's two things I want you to notice here. So the first one is that the blue line, which represents sleep, that decays faster than the white one. Okay, and, and that's essentially what that means is that sleep is lower dimensional than wakefulness. The activity during sleep is lower dimensional. And the second thing I want you to notice is that the confidence intervals around the blue line are smaller than the ones around the white line. And what that means is that if we split the data up into segments and make all, multiple estimates of this, that with sleep, you get a very similar estimate each time and with wakefulness, you don't. And so essentially this is uh, the so-called reliability index we have, what it basically shows in these four different brain regions we looked at that sleep is more reliable. And that makes sense because what it essentially means is that sleep is a more homogeneous state, slow wave sleep is a more homogeneous state than wakefulness is. And then when people talk about spontaneous activity, there's really no such thing as spontaneous activity in the awake state because the animal's always doing something. It's always looking at something. And, um, and what it's doing or looking at changes from, from time to time, right? So the idea here is that sleep is lower dimensional and it's more reliable. And we think the best way of actually making these estimates is spontaneous activity. One thing I wanna clarify is that what I'm gonna talk about is not related in any way to sleep replay, okay? This is more about making a better estimate of true spontaneous internally generated activity. Okay? So humor me on this slide. It'll make a little bit more sense later, okay? Um, uh, so here we've drawn this, uh, the eigenspectrums I've shown you, and this, um, and the gray one is a null distribution while we shuffle. And so you can see there's pink dimensions that explain more variance than chance. I'm going to call those on manifold dimensions. The idea is that, that that subspace essentially contains a manifold, which is internally generated. You have gray ones here, which, which we call non-manifold that occur at chance levels. So they, the chance levels of variance, and we have off manifold dimensions. And these are, I think, the most interesting ones because these are patterns of activity that are less likely than chance to occur. And so this isn't just noise or something. This is, uh, there are patterns of neuronal activity that are reproducibly uh, less likely than chance to occur in, during sleep, during spontaneous activity. So um, we'll talk about that and why that's important in a minute. And um, I don't have time to show it now. But we do have uh, uh, data with optogenetic stimulation showing that this, this is truly internally generated within the brain. <clears throat> okay, so we have the three subspaces I mentioned. Okay, so movement encoding. All right, so the first thing we did was to uh, implant silicon probes into the brain of a mouse and then uh, record from it while it's sleeping and also while it's running around in an arena. And then we tried to predict the running speed of the animal from the neuronal activity in the three different subspaces. And what we found is that you can essentially only predict the animal's running speed above, uh, above chance levels uh, when you're looking at the on-manifold subspace. 
So this is recordings we did in V1. So after this, we decided to go back um, and get some old data sets from the Bushaki lab. We looked in five other brain regions and we found the same thing. PFC, dorsal CA1, lateral septum, nucleus accumbens, base lateral amygdala. All the same thing where the animal's running speed is, is, uh, is uh, represented in these internally generated on manifold dimensions. All right, so then the next thought was, well, is this just some sort of arousal, a uh, single dimensional arousal variable that goes up and down. So um, the next thing we did was essentially what Stringer and Pacateriu did and looked at the animal's face movements, which are uh, multi-dimensional. What we found there, same thing is that from V1, if you predict the animal's face motion, that, um, that you can predict it only from the on-manifold dimension. So this is a, this is a multi-dimensional movement representation. Um, and we did it in a bunch of other brain regions too, just uh, collectively with the neuropixels probes. And got the same result. So the idea here is that um, these multi-dimensional movement re representations are still contained within this on-manifold subspace. So our interpretation of this is that um, the structure of movement evoked activity is not caused by, for example, motor commands that go down from motor cortex. It's not caused by sensory inputs that come back from proprioception. It's actually that there are diffuse inputs that are activating internally generated dynamics that are already hardwired into the circuit. Okay, so that's that's our interpretation of this result. <clears throat> so how is uh, visual stimulus different? So, <clears throat> so what we decided to do here was a similar experiment where we um, plant an animal with silicon probes, record during sleep, and then head fix the animal without moving the probes, and then show it visual stimuli. And so we track three different things where we should track the animal's running speed, face motion as before, and then we show it different natural scenes. And then we do the same thing where we try to predict the running speed, face motion, or, or natural or, or the stimulus identity from the neuronal activity in the three subspaces. And this actually is the same data I showed you before with running speed and face motion, it's the on manifold subspace. And with the natural scenes, it's also the same where we have this prediction in the on manifold subspace. And that was actually expected because it had been shown in the past by other groups that um, the spontaneous and evoked activity in V1 are more similar than expected by chance. But the big surprise, the thing that was uh, really kind of shocking for us was that it's also the off manifold dimensions that also predict uh, the identity of the, 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 the visual stimulus. And so this is kind of wild if you think about it, that the brain is using, there's patterns of activity that are less likely than chance to occur. And it's using those patterns specifically to represent the identity of a visual stimulus. So, so what exactly are these patterns that are less likely than chance to occur? So this is the first tint right here. Um, and that's just showing the first. Uh, so what these are, these are the loadings of the, of the neurons onto the principal component. So essentially means this is how much each of the neurons in the population we recorded participates in this first principal component dimension. And this is the last one, which is off manifold. As you can see, this one is what we call dense, and this one is sparse. So there's, um, in, so there's a metric called the Gini coefficient you can use to quantify sparsity in terms of the off-manifold dimensions are much more sparse. So just to be clear by sparse, I mean that there are fewer neurons involved. Um, and so at the population level, this off-manifold activity is sparse. That's the, that's the first clue. Um, so the second clue is this. So here's a plot of... Um, so each of these circles here is an individual neuron, and, and we're plotting the population coupling, meaning how much it participates in the on-manifold dimensions, essentially how much it fires with other neurons, with how much it participates in this off-manifold uh, off coding. And so these two are obviously positively correlated. So if you think for a second about what that means, it means that neurons that, um, means that, uh, neurons that are like near the top here which, which strongly participate in this off-manifold coding, those neurons are also very strongly coupled to the population. So they tend to fire uh, with the rest of the population. As a group, they tend to fire densely, okay? So the cells that participate in the coding are strongly coupled to the rest of the population, okay? So there's, this seems like two contradictory things. On one level, this off-manifold activity is sparse, but on the other hand, the cells that are involved do not fire sparsely. And that's exactly what it is, is that it's, there are cells that don't normally fire sparsely. When they do fire sparsely, that's what's off manifold. And that's what makes it less likely than chance to occur because these cells don't normally fire alone. They normally fire as a group. And so, um, so how is this useful? So the idea here 
is that why, you know, why would it be useful to encode things in off manifold dimensions that are less likely than chance to occur? So the idea here is that um, if you have no intrinsic manifold, so that there's no um, organization to spontaneously generated or movement evoked activity, then your activity goes all over your state space and there's no place that you can encode a visual stimulus without movement or, or other spontaneous activity somehow interfering with it. So then if an animal moves, it would see flashes of light, for example. Um, whereas if you have a low dimensional manifold here, as we drew before, um, then your spontaneous movement evoked activity, is going to be restricted to the smaller subspace. And that actually opens up this off manifold coding space, which you can then use to encode a visual stimulus. And this seems to be what we find the brain does. The brain is using these off manifold dimensions. And so the um, somewhat surprising implication of this is that one of the functions of low dimensional manifolds might in fact be to create an off manifold space that's not on the manifold, which um, and spontaneous activity doesn't enter there. So the brain can use that to store high dimensional representations uh, independent of uh, independent of movement and other things, uh, you know, other spontaneous activity. So um, in V1, it's, it's sort of been known for a long time that natural scenes are encoded by sparse activity of neurons, meaning you know, uh, groups, small groups of neurons that fire simultaneously. And the, the way that you access this coding space is through sparse activity. But crucially, it's not sparse activity in general. It's specifically sparse activity in the population of cells that don't normally fire in a sparse fashion. So, that's, so there's actually an interesting link here between uh, dimensionality and sparse coding. So <clears throat> there are a couple other interesting uh, results that I don't have time to discuss, but you can check it out. We're gonna, uh, preprint's gonna come out soon, hopefully. So key takeaway points um, that sleep, we think is, is the best way to, uh, to make these estimates of the internally generated low dimensional dynamics of the brain. Um, movement encoding is low dimensional because it occurs in within this internally generated uh, on manifold subspace. Um, and the reason the visual stimulus encoding can be high dimensional is because it also uses this off manifold subspace. And so the implications are, as I mentioned, that uh, low dimensional manifolds might be important precisely because they create an off manifold space. Um, sparse coding might be important, um, not just for things like uh, you know saving ATP, but actually as a method to, ac to access this off manifold subspace. And, and so studying vision using sleep which strikes me as an absurd thing to do, um, somehow has revealed these unexpected insights into this link between these two things that we didn't know uh, were, were connected. And my suggestion is that it's not much extra work to record while your animal's asleep. And so it might be worth uh, thinking about incorporating that into your experiments. So thank you very much for listening. Um, this was the work done by Ellie de Oliveira and Suyan Kim, a grad student postdoc in the lab. Um, and also uh, season Q also participated in this. My collaborators, Renata and Adrian, and all data sets we got from Bushaki Lab. So um, the bioarchive preprint is going to come soon. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter, I will announce it and give all the information there when it comes out. So um, thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thanks, Luke. Uh, uh, very interesting talk. OK, now uh, open for questions. Um, yeah. Hi, friends. Yeah, I have a question. Did you also look kind of at communication between different brain areas? So whether there's a subspace or whether the subspace where areas communicate kind of overlaps more with the on or the off manifold? Did did I okay? Did you yeah. did you, can know, you did, did know about that? Did you know we did that? Okay, yeah. So um, oh no no yeah. it's just <laughs> that that's a fantastic question. And I was like, wow, that's such a specific oh, question. Oh no, it was really by chance. Fact, you look at that. Yeah. Um, so, so what's interesting is that is if you have um, if you have movement, um, then the whole brain, like it, you move, the whole brain activates. Obviously, the whole brain's going to encode that same movement, right? But it turns out actually that during sleep, that different brain regions, you can you can decode pseudo movements during sleep. If you train a decoder on awake data, you can decode movements from the brain during sleep, and if you decode movements in different brain regions, that those movements are correlated with each other during sleep. Um, and it, so it turns out that if you, if you look at a communication subspace analysis, that the communication subspaces um, during both sleep and wakefulness are, are in the on-manifold subspace.
Mm -hmm. So, so it's, yeah, we're going to, we're going to put this all in one big paper, but I think we're going to cut that out and have a second paper on it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you're absolutely right that this communication subspaces tend to be this on manifold subspace. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, thanks. Dr. Schlossen, uh, I just want to say thank you uh, for the talk. And my question was, what can accessing uh, the off manifold coding space uh, do? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last thing you said. What can it, what? Oh. What can accessing the um, off manifold coding that you were talking about, like what would be the purpose of that to access it using uh, visual stimuli and other things? Oh, so so the idea would be that, um, so, all right. So if, remember I said that if you move, then it activates activity in your brain, right? So, so right. there's about as much evoked activity in V1 caused by movement as there is by visual stimuli, okay. right? So how is it that movement does not cause visual perception and stimuli do? And so how is it those things don't interfere with each other? One of the ideas here is that the off-manifold space, the movement never goes into the off-manifold space, right? Because it, and it's, it's very unlikely that, that the brain would accidentally go into that space. So if you encode something in that space, then the brain can know that it's real, that it was really a stimulus. So, um, so in Amazon years ago, they used to have this thing called statistically improbable phrases, so mm -hmm. when you like look at a book, they give you a list of phrases that are statistically unlikely to occur that occur in that book. And if you read those, it tells you exactly what that book's about. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is that it's something similar like that, that there's patterns of brain activity that don't occur spontaneously. And when they do, then that would be a visual stimulus. Thank you so much. Sure. Hi, look. A uh, quick question about the, um, so, so what about the brain engaged to some specific kind of activity, like social interaction behavior movements? So will, will brain be, uh, but that was also involving a movement, a visual stimuli. So what, what's your prediction uh, the brain that uh, coding will be? So you're saying in terms of what kind of movements or what causes the movements? Uh, yeah, yeah, for, for example, it might engage to the social interactions. It has some visual stimuli and has some uh, moment also. So uh, what, what's your prediction of how yeah, the brain so, will respond to it? So, yeah, so there, there's the story is a little bit more subtle than maybe what I said. So there, there's actually been work where they looked at different brain regions. And I said the movements in the whole brain, but it turns yeah, out yeah. the different parts, different parts of the body um, are represented yeah. more in other parts of cortex. So for example, in visual cortex, it's mm -hmm. mostly, for example, like head, like head and eye movements and neck movements mm -hmm. and stuff. And so in other parts, it could be other things. So probably it's something where, for example, like if you turn your head, your visual cortex has to know to somehow compensate for that. And so I think the idea would be that somehow that, that, this, that this is probably a mechanism by which um, the brain uses to somehow compensate for movements you know, the, that okay. it expects something when a movement comes. So I think it's, okay. it's hard to maybe make it specific about like social versus non-social movements. And I think it's more general than that. Okay, great. Thanks. And more questions? Um, okay. You know, more questions, uh, like thank the uh, friends and Luke for uh, beautiful talks today. Great, thanks guys, great talk. Uh, we learned a lot. I, I'm gonna read a new book by uh, your, your back, you know, for the whole of brain activity, the brain inside out. <laughs> and that's why I've learned how to learn this uh, uh, coding to the more of uh, the behavior. Great. Thanks, friends, Luke, Aaron. Um, uh, nice. Thank you all for your talks and uh, see you all next week. Thanks, Bye bye. bye. Right. See you as long. Thanks, Luke. Thanks, Ryan. Great talk. See you. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for the invitation.